The Lagos State Government has decried the rate of motorcycle and tricycle accidents on roads across the state. In order to check this, the Commissioner for Information and Strategy, Bengal Motorshow, announced that the government would enforce the ban on motorcycles and tricycles in six local government areas, as well as major highways and bridges from February the 1st. He explained that the decision was taken after a robust assessment of the debate on the rate of accidents in Lagos, saying security and safety of the lives of the residents were paramount. Now, from 2016 to 2019, there were over 10,000 cases of accidents recorded at the general hospitals alone. I feel bad because, as me now, I'm a student, so I use this keke to help myself to feed my family and everything. Once they want to ban this keke, if now Kada now is different, but keke is cost, it's almost equal with moto. Moto is seven, uh, one million, keke is 700,000. If they ban this keke, I will feel bad and the masses will suffer. So we made them burn our cacao because this cacao with the help of this cacao that will help to manage ourselves. With the help, the help, the help the, with the use of the money. We're happy to pay our school fees, feed our family. Like most of us here, we have family at home. By five and six children that we are feeding them. Government are not paying us. They are not doing anything for us. And they want to ban our cacao. Why? They ban our cacao. They still want to ban cacao. And we didn't want that. So please. We have to help ourselves in order to cooperate and bring our cacao back. Tomorrow, the issue will not hold. And do whatsoever they like, because it seems the government are pushing them to something else. That's what they are doing. They are not, they are not helping people that are willing to work, people that are ready to hustle, to, 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 to survive. They are not ready to help them. Instead of that, they are, they, are, they are pushing them to something else. That's just it. So majority of them now are going away from Lake. And joining us live in the studio is the former Lagos State Commissioner for Transport, Ladi Lawansin, to share more light on this uh, matter. Good to have you here, sir. Thanks, Amaka. Now, um, before we come to the reactions of the, which you saw, the reports, because we went out to find out from Keke drivers, as you have seen, before we come to that, which we'll need you to respond to, is we knew that some, at some point during the tenure of Babatunde Fashola, there was this, this kind of uh, ban came into play. Why was it discontinued then? And why are we seeing it at such a time as now? Why? Okay. Um, first of all, to respond to issues as important as this, I first of all like to contextualize things. Okay. First of all, Governor Sanwolu has not issued a new ban mm -hmm. on Okadas. As a matter of fact, the Consolidated Lagos State Transport Law had already restricted the use of what we call Okadas, motor bicycles, for commercial transportation along the major routes that have been identified. It's in our laws. Mm -hmm. So someone who did not come, wake up one day, and um, decided to ban Okadas. That's, it. that's, that, that's not what's happening. Our laws have restricted the use of Okadas on major roads. It's just the failure of past administration to enforce it that makes it appear as if this is a draconian uh, administration. That's not the case at all. It would appear so because even uh, when you listen to the statement that was released uh, by uh, Binga, it says that the government is providing alternatives without giving specifics of what those alternatives are. So if there are no alternatives and you put such law into, you want to enforce such law, we're talking about tomorrow is less than 24 hours and this will take effect. How do you want the people to cope? Because the, what, what are the alternatives then? First of all, um, since we like um, criticizing government in Nigeria. It is not criticizing, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. it's asking I'm, I'm questions. I'm a Nigerian. We like criticizing government. So let's even start by criticizing this government, okay? I think that uh, the manner in which even the announcements were made, there were gaps in how the information was managed. Mm -hmm. First of all, we heard that Okadas were not the enforcement was going to be done, then we heard that that is not the case, it's not going to be done, and then again we heard that, uh, okay, now 
Then we said, we heard it was going to be on six local governments, and later we heard 15, 15. local governments. So that aspect of it was not handled properly. Then second of all, in terms of advocacy, even when you have um, a public policy that you anticipate will um, elicit some kind of pushback. So I think that um, the government should have ramped up the amount of information they put out there. For example, I know that every month, the Commissioner of Transportation and the Governor get reports on what happens on our roads, accidents, number of accidents, causes, and all whatnot. So the government at all levels have a responsibility to take decisions based on these reports. So if the governor gets a report that, there, for example, there, there were 2,000 Okada accidents last month that required us admitting people to carry out complicated surgeries and operations. And the Commissioner of Health says, we don't have the bed facility to accommodate that. Then that means the governor has a duty to respond to that. Failure to even restrict or try and curtail the amount of incidents of uh, you know, these sorts of accidents happening will mean, for example, the same Okada person, uh, personnel who are shouting today has an accident, he lands in a hospital, there's no bed space to get him, he dies out there. Then there's going to be a riot again that government is not responsive to the needs of the people. Mm -hmm. so, so, so when you're in government, there, there are a lot of information that you have that the average person out there doesn't have. So I think it behooves whoever is in government as well to be able to put as much of this information out there so that the average Lagosian and Nigerian will understand the complexity and um, the, the pool that is being put on government to respond to these uh, sundry uh, matters. All right, uh, I can see you're trying to make a good defense for the government, but again, we've not addressed, that still does not answer the question to what are the alternatives that the government is going to put in place for these people? Uh, we will come back to you, but uh, we also here in Plus TV Africa try to engage stakeholders in terms of those who are concerned with this as a business and to hear from them. So we will quickly take that report, which we want you to listen to, and then before we uh, continue with the other questions. Okay. Was there any prior engagement with stakeholders before this was, you know, made public? Um, there was, this was news to us. We actually heard about this from the media people who were calling to ask questions yesterday. And what, what did this mean to you? I mean, I was shocked. I was like, wait, what, really? And then we had to go on the internet because there was no formal notification, nothing. We went on Twitter and saw a um, video of the press conference. Mm. Um, I think for us this is, it's a bit reckless the way it's been done, right? Um, beyond that, I think the biggest concern is, you know, like I pointed earlier, right, within the legal framework that they've referenced, which is the 2018 Transportation Law or Transport Sector Reform Law, um, Section 46 clearly, um, clearly indicates that um, this ban doesn't affect certain motorcycles. So motorcycles with an engine capacity of 200 cc's. What do you mean by 200 cc's? So 200 cc's are entry level motor, um, power bikes, essentially. Because okay. when you think about this, right, um, the idea is individuals should be able to ride power bikes in Lagos, right? Modern city and all. Yes. Um, so what people like us have done is to now say if, I mean, we're seeing that traffic is a massive problem. And not just traffic, but like you know, just navigation, convenience, quality of roads, all those things are massive problems. A key thing that helps us solve that is providing safe, safe being a keyword mm. for us, um, affordable. Now, that was an interview we had with uh, Chinedu Azodo. He is the uh, co-founder of Max NG, one of the, those uh, companies that help to solve traffic problems. Now, he is raising valid points there, you know, in terms of how the information was managed, in terms of uh, bringing the stakeholders, consulting with them. Why did we not see such consultation to hear from them and to probably find a solution? Because even this is not as yet the solution to the problem. First of all, I want to say to you that um, um, I'm not here to defend the Sanwulu administration. I'm not in his cabinet. But I'm somebody who has had the benefit of seeing this issue and other transport issues from different perspectives. I would like to establish that first of all. Second of all, it's not an either or issue. It's a little bit more involved than the narrow narrative we're hearing from both sides. 
So on the Okada restriction issue, it's not a ban. It's a restriction of movement on certain roads. We first have to, you know, clearly define what we're discussing. So there are many stakeholders to this Okada issue. There's your car owner who, 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 who experiences the terror that Okada constitutes to him by scratching his car, breaking his side mirrors on a daily basis. He's a stakeholder. He has a right to the roads. There are homeowners who do not like the menace of Okada in the estates where they live. They are stakeholders too. There is a pedestrian who has a right to walk on the walkways that Okadas have virtually rendered non-existent. They are stakeholders to the public spaces too. And then fourth of all, there is the Okada rider himself who has every right to acquire his Okada and every right to make a living. He's a legitimate stakeholder. And then number five, there are government officials, even that are break down to two levels. There are those who are in the front line of enforcing our traffic laws. The LASMA officials, the vehicle inspection officers, the federal road safety officials, who on a daily basis by their sheer numbers or the lack thereof cannot contain the search that is this Okada rider population. They are stretched to the limit and oftentimes you would have heard that many times we lose lives of our personnel like Okada riders get attacked by these Okadas and, would, and some of them die. They also have families who are, de who are their dependents. Then on the upper level, there is a, there are the, there are the major policy makers, the governor and the commissioner for transportation in this instance, who have a duty, like I said, who get these reports about this menace on Okada. Every time Okada takes one way and hits somebody down and somebody dies, their relatives go to government and say, your lack of enforcement has cost us our breadwinner. Mm -hmm. They are also legitimate stakeholders. So that's why I'm saying it's not a one-sided issue. We have to look at it. And then finally, if you take a sample of the population of these Okada riders, a preponderant amount of them are not, for, are not negotiations in the sense that they haven't lived here for the past five or 10 years. So that's a Nigeria problem rushing into Lagos. So you have to look at all the different components of that issue to solve it. Mm -hmm. So for people who are not trained to ride Okadas, even as private vehicles, to now use it commercially, who are coming from elsewhere where they haven't found jobs, that's a Nigeria problem, that's not a Lagos problem. Mm -hmm. So if you're a decision maker in the public, public space, you have to look at each issue along all these different causative factors if I can have a robust response to it. All right. Um, I know that you, you are a former commissioner of transport, so it's an area that you're quite familiar with. Now, what do you suggest will be the way out in terms of alternatives? What, what do we do? Because there are roads that are completely inaccessible, which you know, let's take Apapa for instance. So if we don't have Okadas, the likes of Okadas, people would not even go in there. There are businesses, there are livelihoods, there are families, you know, everything. There are schools, hospitals, and all that. What do we do? I think we, as an alternative. I think we must all accept, whether you're in the private sector or in the public space, that we as a people, Lagosians and Nigerians, have failed to commit to the level of investment we should have to put into our infrastructure, road and transportation. That's a starting point. Then number two, public transportation to be safe affordable and efficient requires that all stakeholders must commit to it. And even this Lagos state government must be able to confess or admit to the people that it does not have the resources to meet the transportation investments that we need. So Let's what take, are we doing now? No, I'm, I'm coming to that. Okay. First of all, we have to analyze the issue first. First of all, let's take a, a city with the population size of Lagos as an example. Let's take Shanghai in China. Shanghai has 23.4 million people. So the public transportation facilities they have in Shanghai is such that through their rail system, they move 13.2 million people. And through the bus system, they move 12.3 million people. So for a population of 23 million, 
they've made provision for 25 million through the public transportation infrastructure and facilities. So that's a model we have to look at because that's where we have to go. But that's because their roads are accessible and they have good standard roads. That's because their roads are accessible because they have invested in roads. That's also because they have invested in a lot of buses and on their rail system to be able to achieve that. So are you suggesting that that's what we need to replicate here? Because our roads are not accessible and that's why we need, actually need these Okada people to be able to get going. And Mark, I've just said that we need to invest in road okay, you and are transportation with me that. So that's why I gave you those statistics. Okay, so moving forward, having said that, um, and you've seen the difficulties that we are all in, what will happen tomorrow? What do you think would happen tomorrow? Because uh, the federal government has said 15 local government areas. Not federal government, Lagos State. The Lagos government. State, uh, thank you. The Lagos State government, 15, uh, 15, we're looking at 15 local government areas now. We're looking at 40 bridges. We're looking at 10 highways. What will happen tomorrow, which is the day this is supposed to start off? I would hope that um, after deliberating and hearing from all stakeholders, like we heard our governor has done, I would expect that by now he should also be trying to put together um, a forum which will engage the federal government and the private sector that we have to declare a state of emergency in terms of our transportation and how to raise money and phase it out. We need to have like a 10, 15, 20 year plan. We're not going to achieve it in one day in which state government is how to find, will have to find resources. And I like to say every opportunity that I get that Nigeria is failing Lagos as its economic capital. Most countries who develop and do heavy infra infrastructure spend get commitments from the federal government because these investments cannot be borne by the state alone. Mm -hmm. If, for example, the VAT that comes out of Lagos up to 60% goes towards Nigeria, there should be a corresponding investment in the transportation and other infrastructure that will support that economic engine room that Nigeria has that's called Lagos. So I think the government now should provide leadership in bringing a forum where they can engage the federal government and private sector operators where investments can be made into the right modes of transportation that will be befitting to the status we're aspiring towards a mega and smart city in which all these people who are doing Okada can be trained to still act in the transportation space uh -huh. within the modes that are acceptable and up to international standards. And that brings me to my next question, which you saw the, the video, um, the Keke drivers reacting to that ban. You know, as soon as this news broke, there are conversations already saying that if this happens, essentially we're taking jobs away from uh, so many Nigerians. I could put the figure at 8,000 following our conversation with the stakeholder, the Max NG, because that's as much as they employ. So if we take all of these people, 8,000 of them, of course, and counting, we're taking away their jobs, source of livelihoods, people, they have families, children, wives, people to cater for. Where what will happen to them? What will happen in terms of how do they survive? Which is basically what they were lamenting on the video which we saw. I think the authorities at both, at all levels, local government, state and federal, need to sit down and address the huge unemployment and youth unemployment um, problem that we have in the country. Mm -hmm. I can't accept that riding an Okada in the format in which we've been doing is the only means to which we can engage them. We just have to be very creative and first of all, we have to be very uh, sensitive and responsive to the fact that we have a lot of our population that are not employed at all, and in some cases, unemployable. I think we need to have a very serious national conversation about that. We have all sorts of sectors of our economy that we have not unlocked. Even in the transportation space, the water transportation, we have done nothing there. I'm going to come then, in there. second of all, in terms of mining, mineral resources, we haven't done anything there. There's so many aspects of our economy that we haven't engaged yet that if we do it properly, we'll be able to find jobs for these teeming youths mm -hmm. who are the future of our country. I mean, we can see the disconnects and we can see the challenges of not being able to provide all that we need as a government, first of all, for the people. Now let's talk about the waterways. Um, what is happening in our waterways? Because if we, if it's able, if we're able to manage, if the government or the state government is able to manage that, maybe that's going to solve the problem. What's going on in that sector? Well, I can tell you that um, even while I was commissioner, I held the view that we we are not committed to developing the waterways yet, and I have a personal conviction that the waterway portends a very viable mode of transportation 
as well as subsector of the economy that will grow the economy of Lagos and Nigeria for both passenger and cargo traffic. Now, when we say that we are going to acquire 2,000 buses, and we say we've bought, and we say we want to diversify the modes away from the roads, and then we buy 10 boats, hmm. I think we're not being serious at all. Like I said, we need to have a proper discussion and commitment to move forward, which would entail for us to quantify how many of our population over time do we need to move through the waterways. So if we have 20 million population in Lagos, that means that within the next 5, 10, 15 years, we want to move about 10% from the waterways. It means we want to move 2 million from the waterways. You have to break it down into the size of a ferry with the 200 capacity, how many of that do we need? Is it 500, is it 1,000? How many should we do in the first year? So we need the, I think the government has to lead the way into this discussion and invite the private sector. No nation ever developed through the funding of heavy infrastructure spending by only regional governments. It's usually by the state government, federal government, internal private sector, and very affordable international finance to meet these needs. As in, a commitment has to be made for us to move in that direction. Unfortunately, we don't have much time. Would have loved to keep you here for more of this conversation, but this is the much we'll take. I want to say thank you, Mr. Ladi Lawansin, from our uh, Commissioner for Transport in Lagos State, for coming and sharing your thoughts there. Thanks for having me.